committed to pushing our people forward. It's, it's relevant and it's important to look back, particularly in these days when some of our most powerful and devoted freedom fighters are no longer with us. Like our brother Kwame Touré, also known as Stokely Carmichael, who just yesterday passed in Africa. And I was told the last words on his lips, the last thing he said was, stay ready for the revolution. It seems to me very poignant that to now, today, 30 years after Martin Luther King's assassination, 30 years after Robert Kennedy's assassination, 30 years after the riots outside the Democratic Party presidential convention in Chicago, that we are here now struggling to retain those weak concessions that were extended to our people under the rubric of affirmative actions. 30 years ago, we witnessed a nation in crisis and those of us who fought to bring about more democracy and more justice faced face the world with great hope in our ability to change that world. And it seems to me now we're facing another crisis, but it seems to be a crisis of despair. And I would like to know how it is we can turn back and regain that hope and regain that energy that pushed us ahead. And I think one of the ways to do it is look back and see what it is we really did and we really said and not what someone else told you we have done and we have said. Um, the scholar, uh, Mary Frances Berry, a historian and a lawyer and a legal scholar, has written that when we think about everything that's important to our well-being, including when we think about the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, our vision as African Americans remains on guard. And it's not simply because there was slavery, but because the vision of others has been shaped by slavery, and because most African Americans still experience unpleasant reminders that we are the descendants of those who were enslaved. And if there's one fundamental thing that distinguishes a slave from those who are not, it is their inferiority or their powerlessness. And it is that what we have been attempting to overcome and destroy and rise past, inferiority and powerlessness. And whenever there's a reminder of it, it is a reminder of our ancestors enslaved. These reminders have all sorts of unhealthy manifestations. And one of the most disturbing and seemingly the most difficult to eradicate, as Professor George James, a scholar of African history, has pointed out in his book, Stolen Legacy, that even though our physical slavery has ended, our mental slavery continues to the present. He wrote that in 1954 saying that mental slavery affected the mind to such an extent that the person in mental bondage will restrict himself and fail to raise a challenge to the beliefs and patterns of thought that control him. And he called this mental bondage invisible violence. What I was part of when I was involved in the movements of the 60s and 70s was part of a struggle to end the legacy of slavery, and one of the ways we ended it was throwing off the beliefs and the convictions that we were limited and that we could only accept what was given to us. I'd like to read you very briefly part of an excerpt, excerpt of part of the speech that John Lewis, at that time, in 1963, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the speech that was censored, that he was not even allowed to make at the March on Washington in 1963. And I'll read you just a little bit of the things that were inhibited, were considered too incendiary in 1963 to be heard on the steps of the capital of the United States. What did John Lewis, who is now a congressman who actually works inside the uh, United States government, but he said then, and this is what was censored. We march today for jobs and freedom, but we have nothing to be proud of. 
for hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here. They have no money for their transportation, for they are receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. In good conscience, we cannot wholeheartedly support the administration's civil rights bill for it is too little and too late. There's not one thing in that bill that will protect our people from police brutality. The bill will not protect young children and old women from police dogs and fire hoses for engaging in peaceful demonstrations. The bill will not protect the hundreds of people who've been arrested on trumped up charges. What about those three young men in America's Georgia who face the death penalty for engaging in peaceful protests? The voting section of this bill will not help thousands of black citizens who want to vote. It will not help the citizens of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia who are qualified to vote but lack a sixth grade education. One man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours, too. He talks about how people have been thrown out of their homes because they dared to exercise their right to register. What is this bill? What will this bill do to ensure the equality of a maid who earns $5 a week in the home of a family whose income is $100,000 a year? He said, for the first time in 100 years, this nation is being awakened to the fact that segregation is evil and that it must be destroyed in all forms. Your presence today proves that you have been aroused to the point of action. We are now involved in a serious revolution. This nation is still a place of cheap political leaders who build their careers on immoral compromises and ally themselves with open forms of political, economic, and social exploitation. What political leader can stand up and say, my party is the party of principle? The party of Kennedy is also the party of Eastland. The party of Javits is also the party of Goldwater. Where is our party? And he goes on, challenging the political dynamics of that era and asks, I want to know which side the federal government is on. The revolution is at hand, and we must free ourselves from the change of political and economic slavery. I was one of that young cohort at that era, 1963. I was just finishing high school. I was one of that cohort of young people who cheerfully abandoned college to become a full-time civil rights worker because I was convinced that remaining inside the institution that would program me to, as they said then, work within the system was not the place to be. It was the radical students in SNCC who attracted me the most, and I longed to join them on the front lines. James Foreman, who just recently, praise the Lord, was able to celebrate his 70th birthday, has written about his early encounters with those young student activists. In his amazing book, The Making of Black Revolutionaries, James Foreman recounted how he was convinced that the people in SNCC held the energy, the talent, the brain power, the determination, and the courage to change certain values in this country. One of the most important values to be changed, he said, was that a person should work for money. These students were saying that we were more concerned with human rights than with money. They were not driven by the profit motive which dominated the society, and they were willing to demonstrate this with their lives. And he went on to say that if this idea could grow among young black people, we could usher in revolutionary change. I became one of those young people, learned in SNCC how to organize, how to think, and how to usher in that kind of revolutionary change. By 1968, I was intimately involved in what we called then the black liberation struggle. I was learning how to take the initiative, how to empower my community, and how to destroy the grip of racism on our minds and our bodies. We demanded power for the people, black power for black people, red power for red people, brown power for brown people, yellow power for yellow people, all power to the people. And as Elder Cleaver used to say, white power for white people, because all they'd known was pig power. It was an era of mass uprisings, of worldwide revolutionary struggles against colonialism and fascism that the compromise of affirmative action was born. And what does it do? Did it promote the escalation of integration? Did it promote the expansion of equality? Or did it just remove barriers to jobs and allow a limited form of inclusion in a society that had kept us on the outside looking in. 
It didn't restore segregation. It didn't ensure liberation. But it did put us in a position to have some of the things that our ancestors had made possible for the white people in this country to enjoy. Because I assure you, if it hadn't been for the labor of Africans, for the millions of Africans who labored, there wouldn't be so much wealth and power in this country to share. So I don't see why we should just be getting a little bit and be glad for it. Now I'm going to go back and tell you a story. I, I happen to uh, think that stories are a good way to illustrate some of our history. I love to study and understand history and uh, law, and both of those areas, which I will talk somewhat about, uh, depend on stories. So I'm going to tell you a story, and it's true. Um, it happened a couple of years ago. I was speeding along Interstate 85. Yes, lawyers, lawyers can speed. I was going uh, about, I was 70 miles away from Montgomery, Alabama, where I was headed for a 9 a.m. meeting at the Alabama Judicial Council. And when I looked at the clock on the dashboard and it said 8.30, I knew I would miscalculated how long it took to drive from Atlanta to uh, uh, Montgomery. So I jammed my foot on the accelerator. And at that very moment, across the grass meridian, I saw flashing blue lights atop an Alabama State Trooper's car. So I knew he was after me. I slowed down, moved over to the shoulder, and when my side uh, mirror showed a brown-skinned hand sticking out of his shirt sleeve, I breathed a sigh of relief. What's the emergency? A trooper wearing a Smokey the Bear hat said slowly. I'm trying to reach Montgomery by nine, I answered lamely, relaxing as I heard the familiar cadence of his southern speech. You can't get there that soon unless you can fly, he told me. So I handed over my driver's license and rental car receipt, and he began scribbling down on his pad. But I felt puzzled. He kept staring at me, staring at me in an odd way. And then he asked for my social security number. I thought that was odd, but I rattled it off. Then he asked, what is your race? That's a racist question, I blurted out. It doesn't belong in that form. He said, well, you've got a point, but the question is here and I need to fill it out. So I told him, no, you don't. Just leave it blank. There's no connection between my speeding ticket and my race. It shouldn't be on the form. So he said there was no connection between my social security number and speeding either. So I argued, well, maybe it's relevant to weed out fake driver's license, but race is not, and I am not going to answer it because I thought it was a derogatory question. My mind at that moment flashed back to the times I heard my parents argue about a racial mix-up that occurred back when I lived in Alabama in the early 1950s. My mother's driver's license had identified her as white, while my father, whose complexion was lighter and his hair was straighter, was identified as Negro, which bothered him to no end because he figured if anybody should be mistaken for white, it should have been him. <laughs> so hearing Smokey the Bear's question, triggered my own memories of pervasive classification by race, and the echo in that traffic ticket rekindled my old fury about racist subjugation. Segregation had saturated my childhood in Alabama. It fueled those grassroots movements that erupted enthusiastically in the wake of the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown decision. My hometown of Tuskegee Institute was only 45 miles away from Montgomery where the bus boycott launched the modern civil rights movement, which had pulled me into its vortex by the early 1960s. Of all the deaths that defined that movement, it was the killing of my childhood friend, Sammy Young, that continued to haunt me. He was 21 when he died. We were the same age. As a radical student at Tuskegee Institute, Sammy's dedication to voter registration and anti-segregation campaigns generated threats against him and his family. Late on the night of January 3rd, 1966, Sammy was shot following an argument with old man Segrist over which bathroom he ought to use at the Standard Oil gas station. He'd refused to go to the one in the back like he was told, the one that used to be for blacks and insisted he was using the one that previously was reserved for white men in the front. 
Sammy's body was found lying in a pool of blood across the street at the Greyhound bus station, a bullet wound in the back of his head. Marvin Seacrest, the white gas station attendant, was charged with murder, but he was acquitted by an all-white jury. Following Seacrest's acquittal in December of 1966, the Tuskegee students' protest demonstration erupted into a riot. Unable to pull down the Confederate soldier statue in the town square, students painted its face black, wrote Black Power and Sammy Young on the statue's face, and set fire to the square. Fires raged again and again that summer as urban uprisings, frequently provoked by police killing of a black youth, exploded across the country. I was attending college in New York when I learned of Sammy's death. Within six months, I dropped out of school, joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, returned to the South, and followed a path that led me to the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Oakland, California. Back in 1966, it would have been unthinkable for me to go to talk to any Alabama court official about the trial of the man who killed Sammy Young and few Alabama officials would have let me interview them about such a racially charged case. But by 1996, I felt drawn back to Alabama to retrace that history which had so deeply affected my life. And when I think about it in a broader frame, the ironic circumstances that took me into Hunter Slayton's office in Montgomery pinpoints ways that the past 30 years have altered our society. By 1994, I was teaching law at Emory University in Atlanta, where I was introduced to Judge Dale Segrist at a reception. He was a tall, pleasant, white-haired man from Macon County, Alabama, who came to teach at Emory's two-week-long trial techniques program that May. The name Segrist was riveted in my memory to Sandy's death. When I mentioned to the judge that the only Segrist I knew of was Marvin Segrist, he replied, that was my uncle. Dale Segrist invited me to participate in a continuing education program for Alabama judges that he was holding at Tuskegee Institute for the following year. I agreed to participate in part because I wanted to go back to Tuskegee and research Segrist's trial, and in part because the proposed curriculum, which included studying both W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk and Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery intrigued me. That fall, my role at the uh, continuing education program for the judges was lecturing and leading discussions on Du Bois. I planned when I got there to track down the trial record, but I discovered there was no transcript because Segrist's acquittal meant no appeal could be filed. There was a staff member of the sponsoring group, the Alabama Judicial Council, who arranged for me to talk to Hunter Slayton, who at the time of the trial had been the court clerk for Macon County, and he had observed the trial. And he had told the staff member how deeply the trial impressed him, and I was assured, even though Hunter was fairly old, he had a vivid memory of that case. But it turned out we couldn't meet that only day that I had, and so now, the next time I was in Alabama, it was a clear January morning, and I was driving over to Montgomery to interview Mr. Slayton, and I knew that he was going to leave his office for Birmingham about 11. So after I got my ticket, I called him from a gas station in Lafayette to let him know I'd been delayed. You can't get here by 9 unless you're on a rocket, he told me, repeating the same truth that Smokey the Bear had laid out. Race has been dethroned from its ultimate position in Alabama, which used to be a reactionary bastion of states' rights where every license plate bore the legend, the heart of Dixie. Now, there's a monument to civil rights martyrs standing near the Montgomery State Capitol where Governor Wallace used to hold sway. And perhaps because race mattered more in the Deep South, its role has been more effectively rearranged than in those regions where de facto segregation and institutional racism remained less vigorously shaken. That means up north, out west. But in those places where blacks voted and sat anywhere on the bus, rigid socioeconomic and psychological barriers isolated us from the mainstream. 
When I went back to college at Yale, I was conducting research in 1982 for an oral history project about the black community in New Haven. I interviewed an elderly man who at the time informed me that he was the first black bank teller in the city. So I asked him when had he been hired. And to my surprise, he told me 1962. Regardless of a state's legal regime, there was no place in America during the 60s that was colorblind. Race determined what housing, education, employment, social ranking, and treatment before the law everyone received. Access and opportunities set aside formally for whites only opened gradually to a broader range of citizens after the civil rights legislation was passed. However, when I interviewed for a position on the Emory Law School faculty in 1992, all the professors were white. Emory first admitted two black law students in 1966. One of them was Marvin Arrington, who later became the city council president in Atlanta. When I taught his nephew and niece at Emory, the two of them entered a law school where the student body was nearly 10% black. The faculty, however, was much less uh, mixed. When I asked my faculty colleagues how they perceived the issue of increasing the school's diversity, they told me right in my face without any hesitation that to achieve more racial diversity would require them to sacrifice excellence. So the way Emory Law School entered the 90s, to me, seems fairly representative of the way the reluctantly integrated larger society functions. The scale on which we are expected to tally progress has three broad bands. We move from total exclusion, based on race or gender, into a period of token acceptance, where one or two blacks admission to a previously all-white institution is both praised and attacked as, quote, integration, to the present, stigmatized inclusion, where your race or gender translates into an absence of merit. So even though this world looks different, and in some instances has improved, this type of change does not represent the transformation the movements I was a part of fought to bring about 30 years ago. While being stopped on an Alabama highway by a black state trooper feels different, he enforces the same flawed law a white trooper would. Now, admittedly, being free to argue about a question of racial identity represents an improvement over being shot for challenging racial segregation. But as my then nine-year-old daughter observed when Ronald Reagan ran against Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election, that's not a good choice. <laughs> 30 years ago, we debated large questions of how to enhance equality and opportunity, now chiseled down to a narrow contest between affirmative action and policies trumpeted as colorblind, as if those are our only possible choices. The laws that effaced overt legal segregation have forced a more intricate and coded racism to the surface. White supremacists have appropriated the language of the civil rights era. Now they define flying the Confederate flag as reflecting their, quote, cultural heritage. When they want to return to all white control and power, they initiate legislation that they call civil rights initiatives. Our Supreme Court grants First Amendment protection both to flag burning and cross burning, as if they can't tell the difference. While Congress cuts budgets for school lunches, welfare support, food stamps, rent subsidies, and legal services for the poor, it raises military spending and reduces corporate taxation. It is not hard, if you're black, to see the increased enforcement of death penalties, passage of the three strikes or outlaws, and the restoration of chain gangs as a turn to racist cruelty in the guise of fighting crime. And in this climate, the government that once fought a war on poverty now wages war against the poor. But there's a difference 
The poor are not a discreet, unfortunate segment of the population with some viable hope for upward mobility, and nor are they, despite all the insinuations of the debate around so-called welfare reform, are they black. The poor are not all black. Poverty is expanding. The crushing downward mobility that has decimated the middle class and severe declines in real wages over the past 20 years have paved the road to skyrocketing corporate profits. Chief executives of these mega conglomerates now earn salaries that zoom obscenely past 100 times that of the average worker, threatened by layoffs, salary cuts, and downsizing. A Business Week editorial noted that when 90% of the corporate employees' incomes are barely growing, their workloads increasing, and job insecurity becoming constant, the multi-million dollar windfalls of corporate executives are more than unseemly, they are arrogant. Because they convey the false assumption that it's only the executives who are responsible for productivity. And they concluded that that's a disparity that tears at the social fabric. Since the 1970s, we have seen a lot of changes. Combining with dramatic power shifts in international politics, our new tax policies, and our escalating corporate domination of every industry, manufacturing, media, government, and education, has resulted in what? A redistribution of wealth upwards concentrating greater and greater assets into the hands of the top 1% of America's families. Now, when I was a child, I lived surrounded in poverty of the Alabama belt, Black Belt, but I was sheltered because my father taught at Tuskegee Institute that made me eligible to attend a special school. And I developed values in a society in which there were extremes of poverty, but that held against extraordinary displays of disparity. And their compassion and sense of community were there to inhibit conceit and to protect the least fortunate. The Alabama lens through which I saw the United States colored my early attraction to the Black Panther Party's empowerment program. Those revolutionaries I joined in 1967 repudiated the liberal view that blacks were, quote, second-class citizens. And instead, we asserted that black subjugation, weighted down by centuries of slavery and racial segregation, was a form of colonialism. And that is an important distinction, because colonialism under international law is something we are entitled to fight against, to liberate ourselves from. Clearly recognizing that our history, our economic position, and race collided, we were not fighting to become first-class citizens, but like Africans, Asians, and Latin Americans ejecting imperialists from their lands, we too sought self-determination and liberation. After sharing my then-husband, Elder Cleaver's exile in Algeria and France, I returned to the United States over 20 years ago, in 1975, very much practically 1976. That was when I came to understand how deeply that my appreciation of the colonial status of blacks, so obscured by this rhetoric of democracy, had been shaped by my experience in Alabama. In defeat at the end of the Civil War, the former headquarters of the Confederacy became virtually a colony of the larger industrializing United States. Effectively, I spent my Alabama childhood in the third world culture. Now, I am stunned to recognize that during those years that Alabama has grown to resemble the rest of the United States, the nation as a whole has become more like Alabama, more like a third world country dominated by the demands of a massive multinational corporation whose practices generate vast disparities in wealth. The United States has become the world's poorest rich country, lagging far behind other industrialized states in guaranteeing basic human needs. One out of four children is born into poverty. 
not because this economy does not generate wealth, because the wealth has become so tightly concentrated at the top. The gap that separates the rich from the poor has gotten so wide that over half the population now earns less than the combined incomes of the upper 4%. Now that's earnings, that's your salary, what you are paid. But even more glaring than disparities in earning, the accumulated wealth of 1% of America's richest families equals nearly the wealth, that is what you have, what you keep, the wealth of the bottom 95%, according to economist Holly Clark. Now this is a degree of inequality that portrays an oligarchy, the rule of an elite, not a democracy. That's not hard for me to recognize. Oligarchy was a political system that dominated Alabama when I was a child, particularly obvious in those black belt counties where blacks were the overwhelming numerical majority. Now it's a form of political economy, whether here or in the third world, that feeds violence, crime, corruption, and social decay. It nourishes scapegoating against blacks, immigrants, and poor women as the cause of economic distress, justifies brutal repression, and undermines the foundation for democracy. Although those, are stuck, those who are stuck in the most vulnerable social positions, the poor urban youth suffer the most, clearly concern for social exclusion, lack of opportunity, insufficient employment, and powerless is not something only black people care about. However, the increasing concentrated ownership of television, film, and publishing networks and the news media, all the sources of information, yield some shallow glorification of individual freedom and prosperity. So when you have a tight cluster of conglomerates like Westinghouse, General Electric, and Time Warner dictating what the majority of Americans get to see, get to read, get to hear, and therefore begin to think about, this profoundly inhibits the individual citizen from obtaining any information that questions the corporate view of the world. Dissent, debate, and criticism are being squeezed out of the news publications and the airwaves, which instead give you a narrower and narrower and narrower range of opinion, shifting further to the right every year. The ways in which our political democracy and economic self-sufficiency have been vitiated are almost never examined since the mass media permits only the meekest challenge to the corporate interests which own it. The legal scholar Charles Wright has pointed out in his book, Opposing the System, that our contemporary government operates as an invisible system that has no name. It combines two kinds of government, public government and private economic government that function together. This masterfully circumvents the Constitution, nullifies popular democracy and overrides the free market. It usurps our powers, it dominates our lives, yet we can't des describe it or see it because it's new. And as this system becomes increasingly incapable of including everyone in the prosperity that was its main justification, we can recognize what he calls the dehumanization and damage to human beings that are the side effects of the system. And as these pathologies grow more acute, the system resorts to blame and repression instead of reform. It is now producing a slow but overwhelming catastrophe that threatens to engulf us all. When my parents attended college, there was a catastrophe called the Great Depression that engulfed the country. Back then, government leaders implemented radical programs to rescue the disintegrating society, creating the New Deal. But since the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, that New Deal concept that government can serve to enhance the political power of working, poor, and middle-class people disenfranchised by economic powers beyond their control has been viciously undermined. According to Professor Weldon at, Wolin at Princeton, the combined consequence of the Republican counter-revolution, the collapse of liberalism into centrism, and the general onslaught against government, Washington, and public officials has been nothing less than the discrediting of the fundamental principle of a democratic society. That is, political power and the political office are meant to serve the needs of the majority. 
So if our system and this democracy has been discredited in its fundamental principle, what is the alternative? Where do we go? How do we get it back? During the 60s, millions of Americans joined together, opposed the perpetration of the Vietnam War, segregation, sexism, and we fought to expand the scope of democracy. We challenged people making decisions that radically affected our lives, insisted that our views be heard. And it was both the successes and failures of that effort that spawned the radical black power era, which brought to the fore the Black Panther Party. Black Panthers opposed the violence visited against black communities with self-defense and resisted the racism we encountered with solidarity. We not only insisted on all power for the people, but we engaged in political combinations, including a coalition with a predominantly white Peace and Freedom Party to activate it. In Chicago, we pulled together the Puerto Rican Young Lords, the Appalachian Whites Young Patriot Party, the Asian Red Guards, a gang called the Black Keystone Rangers, into the Rainbow Coalition with the Black Panther Party. The leader of this effort, Black Panther Party Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton, was assassinated during his sleep in an FBI-planned pre-dawn raid on his apartment in December of 1969. Fred Hampton, a charismatic and devoted revolutionary leader, was only 21 when he died. His fate was similar to that of Medgar Evers, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy, all struck down by assassin's bullets all whose eloquent commitment to a better world inspired my generation to resist oppression. Assassins not only silenced their eloquence, but they also demolished the social implementation of the democratic vision these leaders expressed. The repressive assaults of that era mounted all the way up to the Democratic Party inner circles during the Nixon administration, ultimately exposed during the Watergate scandal. Now what's important is to understand that the reality that we are up against today has been systematically put in place by those who have arrogated extraordinary powers to themselves after the political leadership of a more humane and democratic order was annihilated. It is not accidental and it has not always been like this. It is constructed, it was put together, and it could be taken apart. African Americans were scattered through all levels of the society, were neither integrated nor segregated. In fact, it seems like we are fragmented. There are millions of us among the masses of hardworking people. We have a rapidly growing middle class and a escalating underclass. Now, I think that to understand how the expansion of the African-American middle class over the same period of 30 years I've been looking back at, juxtaposed to this era of economic decline, explains something important about the dynamics of social change. And it is very relevant to understand now that the midwife of those changes is under unremitting attack from the far right. Now I want to step back and look into our history. Go back before the Civil War, back to the time Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States and wrote his book about democracy. He also noticed the condition of blacks in the United States. And about them he wrote, more than a century ago, that the legal barrier which separated the two races is tending to fall away, but not that which exists in the manners of the country. Slavery recedes but the prejudice to which it has given birth remains stationary. And he noticed that in those parts of the Union where blacks were no longer slaves, they were also not in any way close to whites. On the contrary, de Tocqueville concluded, prejudice appears to be stronger in states which have abolished slavery than in those where it still exists. He recognized that although the Negro is free, he shares neither the rights, nor the pleasures, nor the labor, nor the afflictions, nor the tomb of him whose equal he has been declared to be. Now this is quite some time ago. We're talking over 100 years ago this was written. What de Tocqueville pointed out was that the prejudice which repels, as in his words, the Negro, seems to increase 
in proportion as they are emancipated, and inequality is sanctioned by the manners while it's removed from the laws. And he thought that the answer to the question why Americans have abolished slavery in the North and why they maintain it in the South was easy. He said it wasn't for the good of the Negroes, he wrote, but for that of the whites, that measures are taken to abolish slavery in the United States. The Civil War had not yet erupted when de Tocqueville traveled here, but the relevance of his insight that black progress is contingent on the benefits it gives to dominant whites may be enduring. I ask you, why did the extraordinary civil rights victories produced by the Civil War collapse so quickly? Within 30 years of the Union victory, the revolutionary transformation of the Constitution lay in shambles. The 14th Amendment, enacted in 1868, permitted Congress to pass a series of civil rights acts, but in the wake of a severe economic depression and the withdrawal of federal troops from the reconstructed South, the Supreme Court struck down those acts in the 1880s, articulating the doctrine of separate but equal. In its 1896 Plessy decision, the Supreme Court allowed nationwide disregard of the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection under the law and permitted Jim Crow to cover the South. The Supreme Court never acknowledged that separate but equal violated the Constitution until 1954, which initiated a new cycle of modern civil rights legislation which resurrected the 19th century civil rights laws. Now, if the culture of racial stratification in which we live sustains any of the elements that supported the analysis that Tocqueville made, then what we would see by the transformations that the new civil rights laws have set in motion is in fact more racism, or at least racism of a different sort than the prohibited overt practices. And instead of law increasing racial harmony and understanding, we can anticipate a vigorous destruction of what scholars call the second reconstruction, the panoply of Supreme Court rulings, state and federal legislation and executive orders that bury that whole separate but equal regime. Now it's a disturbing parallel to the racially charged politics of the 1890s that 30 years after Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court has upheld several challenges to electoral districts established under its provisions, as you who live in North Carolina are very aware. So what does that mean? That means, according to James Baldwin, who wrote about the 1981 child murders case, that this country in total, from Atlanta to Boston to Texas and California, is not, he says, not so much a vicious racial problem. Many, if not most countries, are that. But a paranoid color wheel. And for Baldwin, it's the inability to confront this most crucial truth of American history that constitutes the Southern madness. But he concluded, someone told me long ago, the spirit of the South is the spirit of America. Now, how many of you believe that? Here you are in the South. Is this the spirit of America? Mm, mm. Well, many black people believe Baldwin, but I think it's time to admit that the South represents more than one spirit. Everyone knows about the perverse, racialized politics of the South, but I think the South has to be identified as well with the powerful spirit of resistance to its dehumanizing terror. That same Alabama that showed the world Bull Connor and his police dogs attacking women and children in Birmingham shaped the extraordinary leadership of Nobel Prize winner Martin Luther King, Jr. The cry of freedom now and the creation of the first Black Panther Party represent the Southern spirit just as much as George Wallace's defiant insistence on segregation forever. It's a liberating spirit that millions of people who mobilized to undermine the racist hierarchies of the South and achieve democracy is a spirit I think America would do well to recapture if, if we can see through the mask of race. John Lewis said in concluding his speech in the, would have said, <coughs> concluding his speech in the uh, 
March on Washington, we all recognize the fact that if any radical, social, political, and economic changes are to take place in our society, the people, the masses, must bring them about. In the struggle, we must seek more than civil rights. We must work for the community of love, peace, and true brotherhood. Our minds, souls, and hearts cannot rest until freedom and justice exist for all people. Now, when the nephew of Sammy Young's killer can invite Sammy Young's friend to come back home to Tuskegee Institute to teach his fellow Alabama judges about the souls of black folk, uh, there's a little hope glimmering in the heart of Dixery. I think it's a hope that could ignite that spirit of resistance that we need to bring democracy back to the citizens of this country as the concentration of public power into corporate hands leaves community after community marginalized and impoverished. And what that means is to go back to what we were doing in that era of student and popular and mass protest. We were fighting for our human rights. It was the Alabama Committee, Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, the Atlanta Student Human Rights Movement. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1967 declared itself a human rights organization. And when we have a human rights movement, we are seeking the f profound continuation of the revolution that our ancestors brought about when they put an end to shadow slavery to elevate human rights over property rights. It is our ancestors that have abolished slavery, have ended segregation, have sought to promote equality for all, and that is what we must affirmatively do, and that is the affirmative action we need to win our human rights, our human dignity, and our just equality. Thank you. Session. Is it possible to raise the house light? Okay, we're going to have about 10 minutes of question answers. Um, there are mics on the floor. If you could ask um, questions that are direct. I come from AC State University in Rhino, Carolina. I have a question you're dealing with Maria Abu Jamal in the process of him maybe almost, I guess, being uh, put on the death row and actually that taking effect this year. What can you say as far as what has been done? They, he had to say the execution before, but it's looking very grim right now as far as whether or not it will happen again. Well, the question concerns the condition or the status of the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal, who's a former Black Panther who was uh, framed and uh, convicted by really, really uh, abusive process of uh, murdering a policeman in which all the witnesses against him were paid or uh, otherwise put under pressure by the police and the judge who, uh, told the jury that they had to find him guilty because um, he had been a former Black Panther and that meant that he had the mindset that was necessary to kill a policeman. He was a Panther when he was in high school. Anyway, Mumia is on uh, death row in Pennsylvania where he's been for about 16 years and his appeal was turned down. The, uh, his lawyers brought enormous numbers of, you know, spent thousands and thousands of dollars to reinvestigate his case and demonstrate everything that had been done wrong and show everything that was wrong with the case and wrote a masterful appeal, appeal to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Now I must tell you, there has been never in the history of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania a uh, conviction of a black man accused of murdering a policeman who's now on death row overturned. And this court did not overturn it. But not only did they not overturn it, one of the former prosecutors against him when he was tried in the 1980s is now on the Supreme Court. That prosecutor did not recuse himself. And uh, I, I've been involved in Mumia's defense activities to some extent and he, I received a telephone call from him when his uh, case was denied, when the appeal was denied, and he told me that the opinion denying the appeal for a new trial read as if it was written by the prosecutor. The next step is to go into federal court and to demand habeas corpus relief from 
the state of Pennsylvania. He's exhausted his opportunities in the state. The governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Tom Ridge, whom everyone here should write to and ask him not to uh, re-issue um, the death warrant, has said many times that the minute the Supreme Court turns down his appeal, he will reissue the death warrant. Um, he's a former sharpshooter from Vietnam, Governor Tom Ridge, who campaigned on the death penalty and seems to um, have an interest in, a political interest in silencing and keeping people from exercising their rights. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your speech. My name is Ricky Lennox. I'm a student from North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Uh, my question is on the uh, kind of stuff you brought up. What do you think about the movement and kind of the players involved with the movement for multiculturalism? I hear two parts of I hear at one hand that it's a lot of like our generation or students pushing for multiculturalism, multiculturalism category, categorization. Well, you have to tell me what you mean. People, everybody throws around this word. I don't know what they mean until they tell me, so I don't know what you mean by multiculturalism until you tell me. The idea, what I'm talking of, the idea of, like, say, myself or someone else who has a mixed ethnic background, being oh. claim that. What do you think about that movement? Oh, okay. Let's, let's go back to what do I think about that. I grew up, my mother is from Virginia, and she had a very close friend all her life named uh, Hilda... Uh, Yates Warden, who my parents told me was a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. So I heard this all my life, never thought a whole bunch about it, until I got to be much older and I discovered that all these historians, especially the ones at the University of Virginia, are all denying that Thomas Jefferson had any children by a black woman. But I've seen them, so I, you know, it's not, not a big deal. The whole country is filled with people who have mixed ancestry. However, the ideology of America has been something, I like to use the term white republic. I mean, that's not a widely used term. You go, you understand democracy. But the term comes from a sociologist who talks about this. There are different kinds of democracies. And a sociologist from South Africa used the term herringvolk republic, or herringvolk democracy means master race. That means when a community is settled by a dominant racial group of white people and their people who are subordinate by race of caste underneath them, when they become democratic, it doesn't include their slaves or their colonial subjects. So the democracy is for the master race. What you'll discover in sociology and history, political science, law, there's a lot of argument and discussion and talking about what has happened, what the theories are, what the history is within the white republic. And it leaves out all the descendants of the slaves or mixed people or Indians. Or, and I study and teach about uh, laws of slavery. So I'm very familiar with these phrases that you, Negroes, mulattoes, Indians, and people of color, Maroons, Mohammedans. I mean, they have all these categories. So when you talk about multiculturalism, you're talking about the people who have already been designated as outside the white republic. So now, when all of a sudden, it's like we are in a position of, you know, there's 50, um, people in the Black Caucus and they're, you know, multi-millionaires and they're, you know, big shots, big shots who are in the outside the white republic. Now, all of a sudden, we let's discuss how about how we can be mixed. We've been mixed for a long time. So, I mean, either be true and go back and rewrite the history and stop saying you need DNA evidence to prove that these are descendants of Thomas Jefferson, or deal with it now. I mean, I, I, it's sort of like people want to have it both ways. They want to have it all white in the past, and then when it looks like, that's just my opinion. I mean, I don't, I don't think too much about this. We've been multicultural, multilingual, all mixed up for a long, long, long time. And that's why I talk about a human rights movement, because we don't get into these, well, is this for black people or yellow people? Or suppose I'm both, you know? Well, we're all both. We're all people, you know? And what's this, what's the hang up? You know, it's really a hang up about power. If they see that black is the basis of an organization for power, let's figure out a way to undermine this, but we can't use the white racist way. That's been exposed, so let's come up. That's all just my opinion.
Okay. If you come closer to the mic, I can't hear you. Okay, I'd like to thank you for coming out. And my name is Marafa Abdul Haq. I'm from North Carolina Central. And I wanted to know, after you came out of exile with your husband, what type of uh, struggles did you have to overcome to get into a law school and further your degree as you are now? Well, um, <laughs> my uh, former husband and I were living in France and we really did not have much of uh, income or political identity uh, being exiled or fugitives. And as I observed in the 70s, the movements of which we are part sort of disintegrate and crumble and the political will to challenge many of the uh, abuses that we had challenged kind of crumble. I came back into a country that was um, a movement, I should say, or a former movement that was collapsed. And Eldridge turned himself in, he went to jail, he said the country has changed, uh, the political climate is different, I think I can get a fair trial. And um, everybody was telling me, oh, he'll never get out of jail, nothing will ever happen. They were so demoralized, so depressed. So I said, well, it won't do me any good to be demoralized and depressed just like everybody else. I said, he's getting out. Got him out before, we didn't have any money. Every lawyer said $250,000. So um, eventually he was able to get out and get, um, get out on bail, which is a big struggle, and then get a lawyer and then negotiate with the court for a lesser offense. I had been involved from the time I came into the movement in the early 60s in various struggles that required legal action and legal analysis. Now I wasn't a lawyer, I was just a college dropout, but I had learned a lot from watching lawyers and it got to the point I had so many, my husband had so many legal problems, almost every letter I wrote was to a lawyer, every phone conversation I had was a lawyer. I was really getting a very high caliber legal education, so I said, well, I might as well try and go to law school. <laughs> but I didn't have a college degree, so I figured uh, what I needed to do was get into a really good college, work really hard, get really high grades, so I could prove that I was smart enough to go to law school. So what were the hurdles? Um, Basically, filling out the application and persuading some rich school, since I didn't have any money, some rich school is that they wanted to give me a scholarship. And Yale was persuaded. So uh, I was fortunate in that regard. Uh, so you didn't have the stigma that your husband had? I wasn't an ex-convict. I wasn't a fugitive. I hadn't been involved in a shootout. <laughs> and one last question now. I spoke to Soul on Fire. Soul on Ice or Soul on Fire? Soul on Fire. What about it? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't recommend it. It's not very good. Soul and Ice, on the other hand, is back in print. And I do recommend that one. What, two more questions? We have time? One more question. Well, uh, there's a time thing here. You want to have a debate as to which one is going to ask the question? <laughs> well, you mentioned that you, uh, my name is Daniel Bresnan, I'm from a social work student here. Um, you mentioned that you grew up in Tuskegee, that your father taught at Tuskegee, I wondered if you had any experiences or insight or information about the Tuskegee uh, experiments that you oh, no, no, no. That was way, way, way before my time. Other than the fact that uh, there's a mentality in that community that uh, they wanted to prove. All of you here are going to think this is very strange. But the government, um, the, the hospitals at Tuskegee Institute and the public health programs and the, the, the black doctors at Tuskegee Institute who work with the government, the United States government, public health, on this Tuskegee experiment, which essentially allowed grown men suffering from syphilis to go without treatment so they could observe and see what happened to them. One of the reasons that they gave was they wanted to prove that black people would suffer and get illnesses just like anybody else. It was, a, it, you know, it's very twisted, but to establish a form of equality, it's, it's hard for me to understand, it's hard for me to understand, but that was part of the thinking in the 1920s, 1930s when this was happening, that you know, we will do anything to prove that we are equal to you. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but <laughs> it's a very strange uh, 
social dynamic in a county. Macon County is 80%, over 80% black. Tuskegee, the town, was the county seat. Once the voting rights of the blacks in the community after the gerrymander case was lost in the Supreme Court and they had full rights to vote, the uh, movement, the community movement at Tuskegee Institute wanted to demonstrate that they weren't going to just use their votes to wipe out the whole white representation of the city council. Even though the city council, when only the white minority could vote, they made sure the only people they ever voted for were white people. When blacks had the right to vote, the leadership in Tuskegee said, well, we want to make sure that we don't frighten them. And so the first city council elected, it had, I think there's 10 members, so there was like eight white and two black. Yeah. So there's a mindset that's a little, little hard to get grasped. But I will say that the leadership of that movement, the um, Tuskegee Civic Association, withdrew because they said, I think there's a new attitude in the black power groups and the young people here think differently and we will back off. And uh, then they, you know, began to elect all black people and then they'll, they'll tell you too that, well, everything's gone downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <laughs>